Hi Maggie, hope you like the stories I'm going to be reading for you. Okay, Down by the Pool of the Cool by Tony Mitten, Guy Parker, Reese. Down by the pool, in the cool of the day, Frog cried, Wee, can you dance like me? Duck came to see, I can dance too, but not like you, I can flap. So Duck went flap, and Frog cried, Wee, can you dance like me? Down by the cool of the pool, Pig came to see, I can dance too, but not like you. I can wiggle, so pig went wickle. Duck went flap. And frog cried wee. Can you dance like me? <laughs> Down by the cool of the pool. Sheep came to see. I can dance too, but not like you. I can stamp. So sheep went stamp. Pig went wiggle. Duck went flap. And Frog cried, "Wee, can you dance like me? Down by the pool of the cool. Then up sprang Cat with a sudden bound, and Dog came frisking round and round. Goat butted in with a skip and a hop, and Frog cried, "Wee, that's great, don't stop. Then Playful Pony began to prance, and Donkey drummed his hoofbeat dance. But when it came to capering cow, Frog cried, wow, all together now. With a stamp and a wiggle and a flap and a wee, the animals danced so joyfully, till, till with a bump and a slip and a trip and a crash, and a whoops, watch out, and a topple and a splash. Into the pool they flapped and they flopped but did that stop them? No, no, no. For they all cried, Oh! And whoop! And we! Come and see! Oh, ha, ha, he! We're having fun dancing our dance in the cool of the pool. And they splished and splashed till the dance was done. Then away they drifted and down went the sun. As there by the cool of the rippling pool, with a hop, hop, plop, even Frog was gone. Night Flight for the Little Red Train by Benedict Blathwaite <coughs> Duffy the engine driver hurried off to, to get the little red train ready for an important journey. Take care of your new uniform, his wife called after him. Duffy and the little red train were travelling overnight to Scotland. Passengers and post had to be there by sunrise. Jack the guard was at the engine shed to help Duffy with the carriages. They hooked Jack's van to the very back of the train. Duffy was in a terrible rush. Every minute counts, he said. We must be in Scotland by sunrise. Hmm. Now, at the station, a crowd of passengers waited on the platform. Duffy and Jack were very, were very, very busy. There were lots, there were lots of letters and parcels to be loaded onto the train. Duffy smiled. Somebody's birthday somewhere, he said, picking up a card. It will be dark soon, said Jack. Don't forget to fix the headlamp so we can see where we are going. At last, they were ready to leave. Duffy blew the whistle and the little red train steamed out of the station. Woo woo wee! Fuff chuff, fuff chuff, fuff chuff, chuff. Click clack, click clack, clickety clack, clickety clickety clack. Hmm. Soon. Soon the bright lights of the city were far behind them, but the moon was out there but the moon was out, and there was still lots to see. 
Then the little red train entered a long, dark tunnel. Duffy suddenly realised he had forgotten something very important. The headlamp, he cried. It's still in Jack's van. Without light, Duffy couldn't see where they were going. But stopping to fit the lamp would take too much time and they would never reach Scotland by sunrise. There was only one thing to do. Duffy climbed onto the roof and back along the carriages to Jack's van. He had to hold on tight. Then Duffy crawled carefully back again to fix the headlamp at the very front. The little red train flew along the tracks at a tremendous speed. Tickety-tack, tickety-tack, tickety-tack. Hmm, now I can see what lies ahead, thought Duffy. And whatever is ahead can see us coming. The next morning, the little red train pulled into the station. Just as the sun was rising, click, clack, clack, clackety, clack, clackety, clackety, clunk. We made it, and right on time, said Duffy. But look at you, said Jack. Whatever happened, bit of a problem with the headlamp, Duffy said. But I soon took care of it, which is more than you can say about your uniform. Grin Jack, whoosh, hissed the smoke and smacked from the little red train's funnel. Whoosh! The end. Hi Maggie, hope you don't mind, but I thought I'd read you a story as well. And I like this story, which is Round the World with Phineas Frog. And there he is with Mrs. Phineas Frog. I used to read this to my girls, so I thought I'd read it to you and see what you thought, or you can sit and listen, or whatever you want. This is a story of Phineas Frog, which was written and devised by Paul Adstead and illustrated by Tony Goff, who lives in a pond at the edge of a bog. Instead of just water, mud, pondweed and gravel, he longs for adventure, excitement and travel. My life is so dismal, he sighs to his daughter. I hate living here. It's as dull as ditch water. So one day, Miss Frog buys her father a gift. Without any doubt, this will give you a lift, you see, she explained. It's a hot air balloon. Adventures, shouts Phileas. Start this afternoon. He packs his carpet bag, ties his cravat, puts on his best waistcoat, his watch, his top hat. He leaps into the basket, waves Mrs. Frog, Miss Frog goodbye, then lights up the burner and turns the gas high. Farewell, calls his daughter, but as the flame flickers, the anchor is snagged on the seat of her knickers. The balloon starts rising faster and faster. Help, screams Miss Frog. What a dreadful disaster. No, laughs her father. I think it's fantastic. Three cheers for extra strong nick elastic. He holds up his daughter and says, Good for you! Adventures are twice as exciting with two. <laughs> the wind blows them eastwards all day and all night, across the North Sea until land comes in sight. Phileas cries, Let's go down and explore. This looks just the place for adventure galore. We must empty your bag, Miss Fogg volunteers. I'll need it while shopping to hold souvenirs. We'll meet at 6.30. Just let me know where. Her father says, Amsterdam, in the damn square. Now, where are all of those windmills? He added, looking vague. Well, if I can't find them, I'll visit The Hague. Miss Frins Frog soon discovered that shopping bewilders anyone not used to pay, paying in gilders. And yet she buys tulips, cheese, clods and a plate. A jug and a diamond, she gasped. Oh, I'll be late. Poor father hates waiting. It's such a long walk. Perhaps there's a shortcut. I'll ask that old stork. The stork is most friendly but cannot help much. To her, his directions are pure double dutch. So hitching her skirt up, she hops to Dam Square, arriving with sore feet and seconds to spare. Hurry, gasped Phileas. We're off to the Rhine. Our narrowboat leaves at quarter past nine. The balloon is deflated and packed in a case. Then their just journey proceeds at a leisurely pace. 
they sail up the Rhine, past the Lorelei Rock, and after three days, reach Basel and Dock. Dear daughter, says Phyllis, what shall we do now? How about skiing or milking a cow? Oh, no, laughs Miss Rose. In Zurich, the shopping is out of this world, so that's where I'm hopping. Have fun, calls her father. Don't run out of francs. How could I, she yells. There are so many bags. I'll meet you at Bern at a quarter past eight. For once, scolds her father, try not to be late. A music box chocolates, a bell and a flag, and a rich swatch and a, are purchased and crammed in her bag. She then buys a clock, but it's such a tight fit that one of the carpet bag seams starts to split. Some of her treasures fall out through the hole, but quite unaware she continues her stroll. Her father, meanwhile, has been having fun too. Climbing the Matterhorn, thrilled by the view, he learns how to yodel, tries on a leather hosen, and skis in the snow till his feet are quite frozen. They meet as agreed to continue their trip. We'll travel by Ibex. I've heard they don't slip, laughs Phileas. They are used to, to the ice. They carry us over the Alps in a trice. You see them there. <laughs> They sleep the next night on the banks of the Po and the following morning discuss where to go. I know, said Phileas. Let's Venice, visit Venice. Venice. Oh, I can't get the words out, Maggie. Let's visit Venice. Miss Frogman. Father, don't be such a menace. I need more of Leo, a gift not alone. I'm off to the shops. You can sightsee alone. Suits me fine, said her father. I certainly shall. He glides in a gondola down the canal. Beneath the Rialto Bridge to a jetty, says Bon, ad, bon Appetit and dines on spaghetti. His daughter, of course, is getting on fine, buying almonds, a painting and a glass and red wine, pizza, a violin, grapes and fresh pasta. Never before has she spent money faster. Her wonderful carpet bag never gets full, but to ask herself why never entered her skull. They meet up for coffee back in Mark Square and feed the pigeon with crumbs they had spare. We'll travel tonight by the light of the moon, said Phileas as he inflates his burn. We'll drift over Pisa in less than an hour, so keep wide awake and watch out for the tower. Don't worry, Miss Frog says. I'll get your meaning one bump from us and we might stop it leaning. Over the Mediterranean Sea, Phileas breakfasts on muffins and tea. His daughter, who's dozed off as they left Pisa, wakes with a jump as they bang, bump down in Giza. Good gracious, she gasps. I can't understand why he was stopped here. There's nothing but sand. Phileas laughs. There are plenty of things like mummified pharaohs, the Valley of the Kings, the pyramids and the mysterious Sphinx. Miss Frog, unimpressed, says what she thinks. Touring and sightseeing bore me to tears. Surely there's somewhere to buy souvenirs. I've heard there's a market, her father replies. I'll take you to make sure no problems arise. Buy your... All by yourself you will, could meet with disaster. Someone might steal your last pound and pasture. Miss Frog buys an abacus, a bongos and dates, a fez and a purse, while he patiently waits. Then in a felucca they sail on the Nile and almost got caught by a mad crocodile. They chat to a camel who warns them that they should leave as a sandstorm is heading their way. Glad of the warning, they thank the kind beast leap in their balloon and fly off east. Phileas scans the horizons each day until one fine morning he shouts, Look, Bombay, at last we can land again. We need exercise. I've cramp in my kneecaps and aches in my thighs. While stretching her legs with some high kicks and hops, Miss Frog asked her father, Which way to the shops? I need some money. And when she added, Please... Phileas handed her 100 rubies. In no time at all, her next purchase is made. A carpet, then lapis, a sitar, some jade, a ruby and turban. How will they all fit unless other treasures fall out through the split? Next on an elephant, the frogs take a ride, clinging on tight as they swing side to side. But scared by a tiger's blood-curdling snarl, they rush on to visit the famed Taj Mahal. They stopped in Calcutta for a hot, spicy curry, which Philibus gobbles in such a great hurry. And later he suffers a pain in his belly and so has to visit a doctor in Delhi. 
They watch a cobra charmed by a snake charmer. Miss Frog is frightened it may try to harm her. So crossing the Gandhis and through Kathmandu, they search for adventures and lands that are new. Knees knocking, they travel a treacherous rock. On top of an ox cart pulled by a yak, over the high Himalayas they go, heading towards the Tibetan Plateau. Phileas laughs, I'm sure we're the cleverest frogs to have ever set foot on Mount Everest. Then watching a panda eat shoots a bamboo, he sighs to his daughter, There's so much to do, I've longed all my life to walk on the Great Wall. But Miss Frog declares, Walls are not great at all. Her father insists, That's just where you're wrong, this wall is 2,000 kilometres long. 2,000 shops are much more to my test. Say, so walk on your own. I've no time to waste. Meet me in Nanjing, she said. I shall wait by Chanton Palace in front of the gate. So Miss Frog goes shopping and spending yan, buying chopsticks, a teapot, a gong, and a fan, a parasol, and a dainty mink bowl, which more souvenirs drop through the hole. In Beijing, her father sees a tight, Tiananmen Square, the Forbidden City and other sites there. They meet and inflate their balloon with hot air. They fly off due south, but, but can you guess where? I don't know. Look at that little panda there. <laughs> He's so cute. It's Miss Frog who chooses the next destination because it's a world famous shopping location. The daughter is thrilled. The father's not sure. She wants to sing. He's afraid he'll be poor. Later that morning, they land at the scene of Raffles' first landing in 1819. Then father and daughter go separate ways. One spends a dollar, the other one pays. Miss Fogg, the notorious green shopaholic, hops down Orchard Road with a skip and a frolic. A marine statue, just like at the port, a camera and orchard and pearls are soon bought. Meanwhile, her father walks down Clifford Pier and talks to a tour turtle who's swimming near. Later, when he's purchased a ticket, he sits on the pandang and watches the cricket. Then feeling hot, tired and thirsty as well, he orders a sling at Raffles Hotel. He sits in the courtyard to cool in the breeze where monkeys and toucans are perched in the trees. Miss Frog arrives flustered. She's pleased to sit down. I need a cool drink after shopping in town. Refreshed and restored by the light of the moon, they ride in a rickshaw. Back to the balloon. And the monkeys. <laughs> Flying southeast for three nights and three days, they are glad to spy land. Phileas says, We're as far from home now as we can be. I'm glad you came along with me. Of all national parks I can recall, Yoluri Kata Taijuta is the finest of all. Sorry, Maggie, I can't pronounce that. They hear Aboriginal didgeridoos and gaze down on emus and red kangaroos. Wombats and koalas gaze up at the sight of the strange balloon caught in full flight. Leaving the outback and bush far behind, they hurtle along to the barrier reef. They fly over Queensland and New South Wales. Miss Frog starts to grumble. Dear father, she wails, you really are selfish. Why can't you try stopping? It's been a whole three days since you let me go shopping. There's Sydney, said Phyllis. Now all is plain sailing. We'll tie our balloon to the harbour bridge railing. As always, they separate, both feeling merry. She takes the dollars while he takes the ferry. A boomerang, a coral, a knife and some wool and pushed in her bag, but it still isn't full. And although the opera house shouldn't be missed, Miss Frog hasn't got it on her shopping list. She doesn't want to see anything, does she? Flying northeastward past the equator, Phileas boasts, I'm a fine navigator. Our first next port of call will be the Pacific. Miss Frog shouts, Hooray, that sounds terrific. Those islands are the one place I'm longing to stop. Give me some dollars, I'll shop till I drop. Later that morning, they manage to land in Wakaki Beach in soft golden sand. Phileas wonders, Where shall I go? What should Shall I watch hula dancers perform in a show, try learning to surf or lie in the sun, or see the volcano? Yes, that sounds fun. The sight of a hummingbird hovering by inspires him to try out a new way to fly. He travels to 
Kilowa, and a little while later he flies in a helicopter over the crater. Meanwhile, Miss Frog buys a loot and a shell, a coconut, a pineapple and sunglasses as well. Into her bag, all these trophies are tossed, but due to the hole, keep on, keep on getting lost. They meet at Mao and there, after tea, watch dolphins and whales splash around in the sea. Then as the sun sets, once more they must fly, calling aloha, farewell and goodbye. Drifting a northwesterly breeze, very soon Phileas spies the Andes. A beautiful condor flies over to greet them, but Miss Frog is scared and may try to eat her. She panics and gets into a terrible flap, croaks weakly and faints on her dear father's lap. Wake up, shouts Phileas. Don't be a dreamer. Any time now we'll be landing in Lima. Then give me some soles and centervals too, her daughter replies. There's more shopping to do. When they land, it's story as before, Miss Frog leaves her father alone to explore. To find Machu Michu, the old Inca city, he travels by Lama. Great fun, but a pity, the ride is so bumpy. He can't gasp a word until he dismounts, feeling shaken, not stirred. A friendly old anteater gives him a tip. Find Lake Titicaca and go for a dip. Meanwhile... Miss Frog has been spending more money, in fact, such a lot, that there's no longer funny. Without eating haggling, Miss Frog is soon sold, pan pipes and coffee and a goblet of gold. Miss Frog is dazzled by each golden glimmer. Her father looks frazzled, his wallet soon slimmer. First flying northwards, then veering northwest, our two brave amphibians continue their quest. Their thirst for excitement, adventure and shopping still doesn't show the least sign of stopping. They fly through the night and the following day they land in Acapulco Bay. Give give me pesos, Miss Frog says, because I intend to go to the city and spend, spend, spend. True to her word, she soon does just that. A ring, macro, baracas, a sombrero hat and a prickly cactus in her bag must go. So more things fall out and she doesn't even know. Meanwhile, her father, who wants to explore, asks for advice from a goat and a macaw. Amigo, they answer. Nothing quite beats a trip to the pyramid at Shishen Itza. If you prefer something nearer instead, we recommend viewing the Olmec head. Philibus cries, upon my oath, it's rather a rush, but I'd like to see both. He succeeds by hiring a fisherman's yacht, sailing the gulf while it's still stifling hot. They all soon, it's time to move on. They load the balloon and take off and gone. Flying due south, sorry, flying due north. Got that wrong, didn't I? Flying due north, Miss Frog soon locates a country consisting of 50 great states. Phileas, in an attempt to be thrifty, says... 49, dear. We've seen number 50. We've visited them all. If I have any more dollars, hand me what's left then, his young daughter hollers. I think she wants all his money. Miss Frog in Hollywood finds she has spent all of her cash to the very last cent. A teddy, a necktie and a moccasins go into a bag with a shiny banjo. They enjoy the Grand Canyon viewed from a train. They ride to the Rockies and across Canvas Plain. Chugging along at staggering rate, they look out for wildlife in state after state. They catch sight of a bison, a raccoon, a moose, and an eagle regally perched on a spruce. They love Oklahoma and Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. At last, after three days' railway vacation, they pulled into New York Grand Central Station. They visit the sites without delay, knowing they soon must be on their way. As the moon rises and outshines Times Square, their famous balloon floats up in the air. They land in Madrid a week or so later. All they have left is a single peseta. It looks like we're broke, said Miss Fogg with a sigh. A piece of embroidery is all I can buy. They then board a galleon, which seems the most civilised way to sail across the coast. In Barcelona, they take in the culture and chat with a hoopy and a vulture. Then Philippe's fond of adventurous feats runs with the balls through Pam Pamelona's streets. 
Soon he discovers the one thing that matters, escape before your clothes are in tatters. As he climbs the ladder through seconds to spare, their balloon soars away to goodness knows where. Southerly winds blow them northwards all night into a storm and they start losing height. Filiaf scath. What's that smell, my young lass? Don't look at me. Your balloon's leaking gas. Gas, it's punctured, she groans, in the last lightning flash. Then spiralling down, they land with a crash. Tell me we're not stuck in France, Miss Frog wags. I once heard that Frenchmen like eating frogs' legs. We'll be penniless, homeless and legless, I fear. But Phileas says, do not worry, my dear. There's water here, pondweed, gravel and mud. Two weary travellers, this looks pretty good. Where are we? Miss Frog wags. I haven't a clue. I can tell you, said Phileas. But I wonder, can you? Where do you think he is, Maggie? Where do you think he is? I don't, I know, do you know? Have you figured it out? He's home, isn't he? I think that's where he started off, wasn't it? So he's happy now, isn't he, that he's home? He hasn't got to spend any more of his money. Well, I hope you liked the story of Phileas Fern. Jessie, Jessie did have some puzzles in the back, but she never did them. And that was the map of all the places that he went to. That you could follow along if you wanted to. So there you go. Did you like that? Sorry about some of my reading and my pronunciations, but we give it a go, didn't we, Maggie? So I hope you enjoyed it. Jessie loves reading to you, so if you want us to do any more, just let us know. But you look after yourself, sweetheart, and give your mum a hug from us, and your brother and sister, and your dad. Bye! Oh, yeah, don't forget Daisy and Killiam. Give them a belly rub from us. All right, bye for now!